how was this lesson for folks? Far behind as usual. <laughs> yeah. yeah, same here. I'm behind, but <laughs> I made it through about half of uh, half of this one, and that was not going very deep into it. Uh, so the spreadsheet stuff, I didn't even get to that. Um, but it's uh, it continues to get deeper and deeper into what's going on here, which is good. It's interesting stuff. All right, so uh, <clears throat> I think this time we're going to continue with the uh, the tradition that Kai suggested, which is to have folks share some things that they've learned. And I think, Mahesh, are you still uh, planning to talk through kind of your view of the entity embeddings? Yes, yes, Sam. How much time do I have, Sam? Uh, a few minutes. I mean, how, how much time do you think you, you want to go? Uh, see, I normally do not. Uh, I've made a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Okay. So I don't uh, do any. Oh, uh, you froze for me. <laughs> and around, around 20 minutes. I'll go through fast. Uh, is that okay? Or you want to reduce the time? Uh, let's see. I don't have a lot of, uh, material to go through. So I think probably, you know, if you keep it to 15 minutes or less and we'll just, uh, um, kind of play it by ear. That works okay. for me. How okay. does that sound for folks? Yeah. Okay. So uh, what I'll do is then I'll, I'll, I'll go through the presentation and then maybe I'll take questions at the end. Okay. If uh, people have any so you will uh, share my screen or how do you? Uh... Uh, so if you go to the Zoom window, there's a share one screen button. One second, one second. Uh, yes, I can see it. Uh, okay, is it visible? Uh, no, I don't see it. Uh, here we go. You I don't see anything, but it says you started screen sharing. There we go. Okay. So I'll start, right? Yep. Okay. So essentially, uh, the objective is to offer a, you know, a simpler in a real world uh, intuitive understanding without getting into the mathematics and, you know, word embeddings. So two, two key questions. What are entity embeddings and why are they important? I'll take the importance part first, because to me, this has been the most uh, important uh, you know, lesson is that uh, they can perhaps uh, help reduce the importance of domain knowledge. Because you know, as practitioners, uh, normally when you suggest any software or even an AI solution to any customer, the first question that they ask you is, you know, what do you know about my domain? So this particular technique, I think, can possibly help in reducing the importance of domain knowledge. So when I say domain knowledge, what do I mean? I mean industry vertical knowledge. I mean functional horizontal knowledge. And I mean geography specific knowledge. So every knowledge that we have essentially can be clustered into these three categories. So uh, <clears throat> now this is actually a quite a recent, uh, I would say, uh, I would not call it as an invention, but a recent insight. Uh, the first uh, one probably uh, which uh, Yoshua Benjua's team applied it in their uh, paper which reference I have given over here. And this was in 2015 where uh, they did taxi destination prediction using entity embeddings. And the second one was this Rossman stores uh, sales predictions. And actually even if you see the videos of uh, Jeremy Howard, he keeps saying that there are just two published papers uh, in this uh, field. So these are the two papers which are there. So essentially, what are entity embeddings? And uh, you know, we can break, break this down into two parts. What are entities and what are embeddings? So entities are just nouns. So any, any noun that you see is an entity. So it's a store, a customer, product, supplier. Okay. And uh, key issue is how are entities represented within information systems or IS? They are represented as entity instances. So every record has an entity instance. So let's take, for example, a store entity. 
so a store instance in any information system can have any value you know you could say one or you could say macy's ny is a is a store instance or xxx or missing or whatever now these store instance value does not really help us in making any predictions you know whether they are one or xxx or unknown so essentially the key the key uh, the key things that all, all all of ai does is making predictions so how do we make predictions you know we we use artificial neural networks which are essentially uh, you know this the same uh, diagram which is a input layer hidden layers and output layer these are the more uh, you know a more detailed diagram which has got all the different mathematics which goes into an artificial neural network uh, we also have uh, since this course is on deep learning for coders we also have what is called as deep neural networks which are essentially artificial neural networks with many layers now there is no uh, standard hard and fast rule as to what many means over here but most people say that if you have more than two layers you are really, you can call it as a deep neural network most of the industry uh, scale uh, networks which are being used at you know let's say google microsoft or facebook are essentially hundreds of layers uh, deep so a dnn also makes predictions like any other ai system this is how a dnn looks like we feed in some numbers we get out some numbers so in the context of store sales which is the rossman store sales competition or any other retail store you essentially have the inputs as let's say i have taken just four entities over here i have taken store id product id sale date id and customer id and the output is your sales of the stores as predicted by the dnn now essentially these are these have been abbreviated by me into sid pid did and cid plus more so essentially we we just have these four main entities plus you could have other data also and this travels into the neural network as a single record so let's say before entity embeddings came into you know the scene you would take data from your information system you could have a store number or you could have a product code and these would travel along with the rest of the record into your neural network M multiple rows of these you know one one row for each instance now essentially uh, so we we would have store id along with other data now the problem as i said is the store ids do not really give you any do not any give you any uh, information as far as the any insight you know as far as the system is concerned it is just a uh, a unique identifier for the store so how do we get insight the key issue really is the causal insight not casual insight causal insight is actually what is causing sales to happen what is causing the dependent variable which in this case happens to be the store sales prediction so here here and embeddings uh, come into play uh, we talk of uh, store embeddings so when we talk of store embeddings what are they so what is an embedding an embedding essentially as per the definition is an instance of a mathematical structure which is contained within another instance don't get too too worried about the definition the key words really here are mathematical and within so we need to understand uh that uh, we an embedding needs to have certain numbers and it it has to be within something else so this is the intuition of a store embedding the question that we need to ask is what do we know of stores in the real world you know this is a question we can ask of any entity if someone asks me to create an uh, you know an embedding for a user i will say how do users uh, let's say behave in the real world or how do movies behave in the real world you know movies can be long or short movies can be boring action non action so the questions really have to come from the real world knowledge of the system so possible answers as regards stores are some of the following may be true a store could be large or small based on size it could be profitable or unprofitable it could be open or closed it could be stand alone or it could be in a mall yeah. it could be downtown or it could be uptown mm -hmm. Yeah, and many and many other factors you know there are many more factors and this really depends on how much information do you really have in the system so how can we incorporate these factors in our dnn so essentially what we need to do is these five factors that i have shown over here and there could be many more we need to put this inside our dnn instead of the store id so because for a neural network in general the more numbers you have the better it is 
So instead of store ID, we use a store embedding matrix as an input. So these are my five factors. These five factors get converted into an embedding matrix. So this is my matrix and we use numerical inputs. So what are the numerical inputs for every factor? We assume that there is one numerical input. So if I'm, if I'm looking at, let's say downtown, uptown, my, my number would be N5. If I'm looking at large or small, my number could be N1. Now just uh, as a, you know, because this is a question which has been asked many times in the videos also, how large a size should be this embedding matrix? Now, Jeremy has given some thumb rule. He says, if it is, you know, usually you should take half the size of your cardinal values with a maximum, lim with a maximum limit of 50. There's some noise. I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially, my hunch is that the, the more information you have on the real world, the better is your system because the intuition is that your, you know, your understanding the, ca the, the causal effects become much more easier for the DNA. So essentially, this is my store embedding, which is my numbers N1 to N5. It could be, it could be much more. And this is for each store. So let's say in Rossman, uh, in the Rossman example, you have 1100 stores. So you would have 1100 such, uh, you know, rows one below the other. For this is for each store instance instead of a store ID. So essentially, the, the store ID which I showed earlier is getting replaced by a matrix which has got uh, these five numbers. So this will be the matrix. If I have, let's say, five store IDs, I will have a matrix of five, uh, five by five embedding. If I have a thousand, uh, you know, store IDs, I will have a matrix of uh, thousand rows divided by uh, multiplied by the number of uh, embeddings. In this case, it is five. It could be fifty. Uh, so this is the matrix plus we have other embedding matrices too. So you have a product, you have customers, you have sale dates. Now just one, uh, one confusion, which has again come up in the forum discussions and the videos is, you know, on this issue of sale date. Now, although I have not covered it in depth over here, but a sale date is a noun. So wherever you have nouns, you can put in, you can put in an embedding. Because there was earlier, uh, I mean, uh, in, in one of the earlier, I think, questions, somebody had said that, look, sale date is a, contig is a contiguous value. I think uh, Jeremy says that uh, one of the fast AI, uh, I think, library, it has a function called add underscore uh, date part. When you add underscore date part, that single date value gets, uh, you know, replaced by a column of uh, rich uh, date representations like start of the month, you know, end of the month, start of the quarter, end of the quarter, which essentially means that we, even the single date value is giving rich information to the DNN, which enables it to, let's say, say that, okay, Saturday is similar to a Sunday because both happen to be weekends. Maybe a Monday is similar to a Tuesday because both happen to be working days and so on. So essentially we have, uh, for every entity, we have a store embedding matrix, we have a product embedding matrix, which means that in the single record, which I showed earlier, just like the store ID, the product ID will get replaced by its own embedding. Similarly, you will have a date embedding. You have a customer embedding. You will, you know, the date, uh, embed, the date ID gets replaced. The customer ID gets replaced and many more. So these are all the embeddings that we really have. Now, how do we get these numbers? We start with a random initialization and the model learns from the training data set to arrive at the same. Now, this is a bit confusing because what happens is, you know, in the initial, when we talk of an input layer, we, uh, we have, let's say a store ID, which is echoing as a record. But when we are saying that we are learning the embedding values, see, I have not studied the, 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 the code of the fast AI library, but I presume, uh, and I think Jeremy mentioned it in one of the, one of the lectures is that all the embedding um, uh, entity embedding values, get initialized to one and the weights of those embeddings, you know, essentially the weights will also travel in, uh, you know, uh, along with each embedding, the weights are the ones which, which get learned from the back uh, propagation mechanism. I need to confirm this after having looked, looking at the code, but this is my hunch. So essentially, uh, if you look at the video five, you know, the question, which one, which one of the persons asked me on the, on the dot dot product, which is, essentially, you know, which was a user, uh, uh, user and movie ratings. So even there, if we, if we realize, you know, what we are creating is a user entity, uh, embedding matrix and a movie entity embedding matrix. So in video five, what Jeremy is actually done is 
he's done the first part of the uh, entity embedding with an excel which i think is a very useful uh, thing to do because once you understand the concept of the of how the you know matrices are getting initialized then one needs to look at the pytorch later on once you are comfortable with the pytorch code so both the bo but essentially the same thing is happening so what is the key insight the key insight is that over a period of time with sufficient training data and updates the entity embedding values start reflecting the real world causal factors accurately in fact if you see if you hear one of the videos jeremy talks about uh, instacart he talks about uh, another organization where i think it was uh, uh, where he says that uh, that organization collects uh, generates standardized entity embeddings which are then circulated to everybody in the organization and these entity embedding values actually act as uh, inputs uh, to the other uh, you know machine learning systems which are being used by the organization now to me that is a very key insight because what is happening is you know uh, uh, you know the, the the dnn is running the, you know the neural network is running all the time and with every instance of data you know it is becoming more and more more and more accurate in fact if you see the paper also of uh, the paper which i mentioned which was given by one of these uh, people who has uh, done this uh, insight they also talk of the same thing and what they have done is even though i have covered only neural networks over here they have used the same entity embedding matrices to even work with let's say random forests to even work with gradient uh, you know boosted uh, machines and so on which really means is that it this is a practice the, you know this is a this is a discipline which which is conceptually at a much higher level than any of the specific uh, algorithms that one could learn in machine learning so for me really this is a key insight uh, in terms of uh, how uh, you know companies can uh, organizations can literally learn much faster as, as long as the, you know they they have their domain experts sitting with the you know machine learning engineers and uh, and deciding what would be the uh, the factors which would be a part of the entity embedding matrices so a summary the importance of entity embedding i said it can it can probably replace domain knowledge because in that rossman stored steels competition the first two winners were companies who literally had couple of decades of uh, experience in you know handling logistics uh, and for the retail sector the the gentleman who won the third prize uh, who's uh, the company neo i think it was neo cami this guy is a physics uh, graduate and you know he was able to probably uh, you know just look at the mathematics part of it which actually if if you see from a from a end user point of view or a customer point of view you know it's something which is really unbelievable people really don't believe you when you tell them that you know this is all mathematics but still i can give you predictions which are as good as let's say what your domain expert could come up with so entities are nouns don't get very you know don't get worried when you look at entity just any any noun which you find in the real world becomes an entity embeddings are mathematical structures and the question to ask is to arrive at the matrix what is happening in the real world to cause this entity to behave now as you can imagine this will vary from company to company this will vary from organization to organization this will vary from you know if if you if you look at medicine let's say for a patient you know the the entity embedding matrices will be very different if it's a cancer patient it will be very different from let's say somebody who's a non cancer patient and so on so really what what this does is it gives you a mathematical structure in which properties of the entities are being captured in a form which is reusable for the organization this so which really look which really means that the 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 roi you know with the return on investment is once an organization starts going on this path really becomes very very uh, very very achievable you know in a measurable sense and uh, entity embeddings reflect real world factors accurately more research is required because it is a new area as jeremy has been saying there are probably just a couple of papers on this and uh, people have started writing on it but i suspect a lot of companies are, are using it and not talking about it i think this will have tremendous applications as far as accelerating deep learning is concerned it has got good potential ahead any questions awesome um, thank you mahesh. mahesh thank you yeah i have a question mahesh yes i'm i'm thinking like you know the uh, the convolutional neural networks you have the that paper of Z ziegler and fergus where it does a yes. deconvolutional deconvolution yes. to figure out which like this uh 
this next higher up layer is looking for lines and then the higher up ones looking for eyes and noses and the next level is looking for faces. I wonder if there's yes. a similar method like a de deconvolution for entity embeddings so that you know what each of the embedded values might represent. Like you said, one might represent like the geography, one might, another entity, uh, another might represent, you know, whether it's in a mall or not, something yeah. like that. I, I wonder if you're looking, if you found anything like that. No, to be very honest with you, uh, uh, I have not uh, looked into it, but I suspect, you know, once once with maturity, you will start getting, uh, because see, what, what, uh, what really happens is once these values uh, start getting built up over a period of time, if, you're, if your business is the same, the values will not change, you know. For example, a simple question is, what do I do on a Sunday vis-a-vis, -vis what, what do I do on a Monday? You know, on Sundays, I get up late. On Mondays, I get up early. So this, my, my behavior doesn't change drastically. So I, my, 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 my hunch feel is that uh, you could probably get, uh, you know, higher layers, which really are picking up uh, behaviors, uh, you know, from the lower layers or, or let's say some of the higher level, uh, higher, uh, the, the later layer uh, matrices or the later layer uh, calculations will depend on the earlier layer calculations. but I don't have actual data. You know, see, because well, well, this is a group which I think is primarily a technology group and we've seen the video lectures, but try giving the same pre presentation, let's say to somebody who's been running a hospital or, or you know, somebody who's been running a, a aer aerospace company and they will not believe you. They say, look, you know, show me the data, show me actually that what you're saying applies to my industry. So I, my, I suspect that we will need to be very cautious in terms of uh, making claims, you know, which cannot really be substantiated. Have I answered your query? Um, yes, thank you. you. You did. Okay. Uh, for me, I, one, one uh, you know, interesting point here, uh, you know, slash question uh, is the, the impression that I got after um, the, the lecture in which Jeremy discussed this, and I don't remember if it was, um, you know, if this is something he said or something that I inferred or, or made up, but, um, you know, I was left with the impression that, you know, not only was there not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship between the embedding values and real world, uh, you know, real world uh, characteristics of the, the noun that we're creating the embedding for, but also that, um, the, an individual embedding value might represent multiple real world factors. So this whole one-to-one -one thing isn't, isn't as strong as, um, uh, you know, isn't necessarily, you know, strong or direct. Um, uh, but the Sebastian's idea about kind of some, uh, you know, is there some way to, to go from an embedding factor, you know, the embedding matrices back to real world, uh, factors is kind of interesting, um, but I didn't get the impression from what Jeremy said that there was, you know, any kind of one-to-one -one relationship between these things. Uh, actually, the yeah. Uh, see, actually, uh, uh, Jeremy really has been looking at it from the mathematics point of view, and he's, he's been essentially saying that, uh, you know, mathematics and, and figures are really what is important. Uh, he, uh, he has also made a point, I don't know whether it is in relation to this, but he says that uh, most of the academic papers, you know, which are published really don't look at, you know, real world data more. Every, every, every academic paper, uh, you know, wants to better a new technique. It, it wants to get a, uh, you know, a faster mm -hmm. results. So uh, my, 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 because see, when you, when you say companies like, let's say Instacart, or he's, he's given another company name, I don't remember. He says when they are yeah, Pinterest, he says Pinterest, he says when these company, he also mentioned, for example, Netflix earlier when they started off. They would ask you questions as to, you know, do you like, do you like uh, romance? Do you like action movies? So they were implicitly trying to build your profile, you know, when you logged in. So my, my, my gut feel is many more companies are using it. Very few people are talking about it because, you know, uh, it, it really becomes a competitive strategy. For instance, if I know that, let's say I'm in the retail business and I'm selling shoes and somebody else is also in the retail business and they are also selling shoes. You know, my entity embedding really become my own, you know, it, 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 it's a layer exactly on top of, it sits on top of almost all your machine learning systems. 
because right yeah I, and i'm not yes, questioning yes. the the importance of it um my my caution is that there doesn't need to necessarily be a one-to-one -one mapping between uh you know an individual entity and the you know real world factors in order for it to be important that's kind of the you know what's great about the training process is that uh the process can figure out these values that you know, certainly they reflect, you know, ultimately they reflect real world factors, but not necessarily in a one to one, you know, value where you can look at a, a, a vector and say this, you know, this 13th item represents, um, you know, the, the, uh, the sales of a given product, you know, on weekdays or something like that. I, I think that um, this information for the model does not even exist. So it's not possible that it, for example, learns that in this number of the embedding is uh, for if it's in a mall or not. I think it's, you have to think of it more like a, um, it can, the relative description of the shops. So it's learning the differences between one shop and another shop and not really, I mean, it, it, it can't know if, if one of those shops is in a mall or in a, on, on a street or whatever. And um, it kind of learns that from the data, but it's not really, I also think that it's not really mapped to this uh, kind of, okay, if this number is one, then it's a, a shop in a street, and if, if it's two, then it's in a mall, and so it's not that direct, this mapping. It's more relative between the shops. Yes, uh, see, there, there would be actually thousands of uh, real world factors which would, let's say, cause, uh, you know, certain events to happen. I do remember in one of the videos as regards the entity embedding matrices, I think one of the examples given is a difference. Uh, you know, uh, I think it one of the papers or in the videos, he talks about difference between a dog and a cat. He says a, a small dog is called a puppy. So one of the factors mentions to the youthfulness factor where he specifically talks about, you know, this, this, this value in the metrics will refer to the youthfulness factor where, you know, so you have a, so this is one part, second part. See, the other part is if you, if you read the Rossman paper, which I have not actually fully gone into depth, what happens is, you know, they have been able to, let's say the, the system was able to find out stores, which were, which were, which were located, which were automatically, I mean, it was able to automatically determine which were the stores in Eastern Germany, which were the stores in Western Germany. The paper actually has a map, has has a has a has a visual, where on one side is is the is the is the is the map of Germany, and on the other side is the embedding which has been discovered. Uh, you know the information which has been discovered by the by the by the neural network. Yes. And there is there is there, there is a you know basically yes. putting together shops that are similar. So uh, yes. shops for example in, in in eastern Germany uh, have similar characteristics, and so the embedding vectors are in. When yes, you look at them yes. on, on the map, they are on the, in the same region, so you can group them together. Yes, yes. So I, I thought that was a very, very, uh, you know, profound insight because, you know, it, it, what it literally means is that you, you know, you have something which is picking up inform, which is which is learning, you know, insights very, very fast. So this was my. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the same with word, word embeddings. You can yes. uh, find connections between words that are somehow connecting concepts people have in mind when you train it with data from from people. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks, Mahesh. That was thanks, very thanks. great. Uh, hey guys, I have a question. Uh, uh, so with this embedding matrix, uh, I mean, should there be a size? Uh, I mean, how do we train it? I mean. Uh, if we get new data, doesn't the embeddings change? I mean, uh, what's, what's, it's, it's, is there a ballpark figure that you, let's say, train with half of the data or something like that, or you train it with a hundred percent of the data, but let's say you get thousand more data points. So yeah. now the embeddings might change. Yes. Actually, Jeremy has answered this question because if you see all the questions people have been asking him are the same questions. What is the size of the embedding metrics? So what he follows is a thumb rule that like, he, he gives the example of day of week. He says there are seven days in a week plus one value for unknown. So, you know, the total number of cardinal values for date is eight. So he says, divide that by two. So you will have four. So he, he, for date, he uses four as the size of, as the number of embeddings. But he, if you see one of his, uh, one of his uh, later lessons, he uses a, a size of 50, five zero. And he says that, uh, you know, it should not go beyond 50. So I, I basically suspect is that he's been trying out uh, various values. 
and uh, he's arrived at this heuristic figure but i i personally would would say that you know you try it out on your own and uh, whatever results you work for you you try it out i my 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 gut feel is the more the better the second part of your question that you asked was in terms of updation of the real real world real time values absolutely see the reason for instance he mentions that pin interest and instacart have been distributing this data to their uh, you know to all their outlets or to to all their uh, systems which which which, which use uh, you know these uh, matrices which really means that this is this is a dynamic kind of a system you know so my my guess is you know the smarter the company the faster you will, you you should be learning your uh, matrices and you should be distributing them to your uh, you know to whichever downstream downstream systems which are using so yes every new value that you you know put in uh, will update it the third question that you asked is about the size of the training set and you know 50% i would say just go with whatever is 80% let's say training 20% validation and you know keep 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 uh, updating the train because I, i i don't know how many companies actually do this how many companies actually you know reevaluate their models and you know there is that there is a term which is used i think it's called uh, i think it's called technical debt technical debt also means that you know we are not really we are not really updating our models to reflect the real world situations so it it's a dynamic situation is what i would suggest i think he was referring to to data sam- sampling and and test training splits and stuff like that and if you don't know about that you should probably go for this uh, machine learning course that Jeremy always mentions that's no no uh, my my question was basically i mean uh, let's say the embeddings we start with one or randomly we initialize it and so we are uh, we have sort of updated it for 100% of our data so now new data comes up so that data will definitely change our older embeddings right that yeah, was my question yeah that's yes, called yes. concept drift you have to some in at, at some point in time you have to retrain your network when your concept in the data is changing yes so yes, yes you retrain the network from time yes. to time if you get new yes. data yes 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 yeah yeah that was the question thanks awesome uh so let me flip back here um so on uh on lesson 5 what what questions or stumbling blocks did folks uh run into relating to the uh the topics from the lesson 5 there's mine Did everyone uh make it through or yeah. it sounds like some of us uh I know I made it through about half of this um how do folks do going through this movie lens notebook and what questions came up I had unfortunately no time for coding this week just the video uh, I was just able to go through the video and just <laughs> I'm able to move forward with that. Busy week. Yeah. yeah. Same, same here. here. Same here. <laughs> well, so to make you guys who just went through the video feel better, I only got went through half the video. So there. <laughs> <laughs> so I've upgraded my machine on Google Cloud, and I can do computation really fast. So I shift enter the whole no- notebook, and it worked. But uh, not more than that, unfortunately. Yeah, well, I think part of that is because we're not dealing with images anymore and this is just a small CSV file. It goes really fast even if you have yeah. a bad machine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, about more and more complex when he goes into details on how the uh he's setting up the uh neural networks from scratch. So more and more and more complex. Yeah. Yeah, I think that some of that is sprinkled throughout where he starts to go into creating these pytorch modules but then i think it gets uh uh i'm at about 3 quarters of the way like an hour and a half into this 2 hour 20 minute video um and he you know just looking at the uh at the time walk through he starts to get into calculating derivatives and integrals and chain rules jacobians and hessians and Uh, there was some uh i think it was david who i don't think is on uh mentioned in the slack uh there was some conversation about adam versus adam w was anyone involved in that conversation or knows what that's referring to 
Now, I think the I think the uh, to what I understand the Adam W is an improved version of the Adam optimizer, but to what extent and how I'm not I'm not quite sure. I think Adam De Adam W is something uh, that uh, is from the fast fast AI group. Someone from them is, uh, has done that. Okay. Um, I can post a link um, in the chat here. So, Adam with weight decay. Mm. Adam with weight decay and super convergence. Okay. And this looks like this is this is brand new. Yeah. All right. Um let's see. Has, did anyone get to the uh the Excel spreadsheet? Like no. <laughs> I wonder if I did a revote about whether we go to, you know, two weeks again for this or, or plow, continue to plow, plow through if we would uh, run into the same, run into the same thing. Yeah, we, we want to extend it. We want to do a second one just for this one, but not for any more. <laughs> <laughs> again, again, just for this one? <laughs> Um, I would reconsider my vote. You would reconsider. Did you vote for keeping it at uh, a yes. week? Yes. <laughs> Anyone else reconsidering their vote? Well, I guess yeah, that's, also, that's also motivation on how we're going to use that thing. So, like the uh, the images were, to me, were more kind of motivating me to learn more. I, can't, I don't see that much use of those kind of things. So I'm kind of fine with what I kind of learned. I'm, I don't necessarily know how to do this from scratch, but when I need to, maybe I will kind of go deeper, but yeah, mm -hmm. that's kind of my approach. Yeah, yeah. I kind of, uh, I, I go back and forth between feeling guilty for not understanding every equation and line of code and realizing that this is probably, you know, I'm definitely learning a lot and uh, uh, it's, you know, meeting my learning need for right now. And <clears throat> he keeps, you know, he said early on and I keep trying to remind myself, I'll end up going through this a few times. Mm. Um, uh, was someone about to jump in? Yeah, uh, actually, I think Jeremy has given the most uh, practical suggestion in this course. He says, you know, at the end of video five, he says, do whatever you feel you, you have not learned. You know, revise that again, which I think I should apply to almost all the videos. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, for, nice. you know, for instance, just, just say, I take an example, you know, stochastic gradient descent with restarts. I still not understood, you know, what it needs to do. So we really have to go down into the depths of back, you know, back to video two and learn that. So it's okay because there is too much of material really, which is being thrown at you at a very fast pace. So, you know, there's no harm at all. You can just take your time back and learn and, you know, then move ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so for, uh, I will put my poll up once again in, uh, <laughs> in Slack. So keep an eye on that. Uh, for next time, I think good things for, uh, you know, if we have folks that want to spend a little bit of time and dig into a topic to um, help folks review, like walking through this spreadsheet and like the SG, SGD momentum, RMS prop Adam, you know, that could be an interesting topic. Uh, a review of this Adam W uh, super convergence thing could be interesting. Um, 
I think a lot of us are not far enough to know the question, the other questions that we might have with regard to some of this stuff. I think there's probably some interesting things in this, uh, in the collaborative filtering, but, um, I found it very interesting how collaborative filtering is so similar to a linear layer in from, from neural network. I mean, you just, uh, added a bias, I think, and it's the same mathematically, the same, like uh, a, a linear neural network layer. That was pretty interesting. I did not see that it from this point before I s saw the video. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I think there are, I've not done a lot with recommendation systems, but there are a ton of different ways to do them. And I know that one of the things that comes up a lot with the recommendation systems is this cold start problem um, where you don't have any uh, kind of recommendations. And I don't, I don't recall him talking about that in this lecture. Um, does anyone remember if he mentioned that? No. Uh, let's see. Code uh, yeah, that you do not have uh, enough users to filter. Not necessarily enough users or enough movies, but enough ratings in which okay. users yeah. have rated movies. Well, yeah. Yeah. I have a question for Kai. Um, yes. And you know, since this uh, lesson five was about you know digging deeper into the code, I, I think you mentioned something about documenting the fast AI library. But oh yeah. I read that there's a new version coming out. So what yes. are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I uh, I just wanted to tell you about that. Um, so I posted an issue on on the on the GitHub uh, repo a few days ago, or it's two weeks ago, I think. Uh, for this documentation and I got an answer now and um, someone told me that they are not going to uh, develop this version of the library anymore so they are really just uh, fixing bugs and they are coming up with a complete new version for the next course which is starting in October I think and so yeah they completely restart the, the complete library and um, if they start with that I'm, I'm looking into adapting the documentation maybe if I have the time and uh, then yeah go on with that but they are not including this in, into this version of the library because it don't make sense they are not going to develop it further yeah and, and they mentioned the version one. We can... is the version we're using for these lectures version one or yes so this version is not going to be uh, uh, so the version we are using at the moment is not going to be developed any further so Hopefully they'll still stay with PyTorch. Yeah, they are. They are. Is there they a place where we can vote for longer uh, parameter names? <laughs> <laughs> you can open up an issue <laughs> on GitHub, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's uh, it's. Uh, I, I tend to use uh, much longer uh, variable names too. So. Interesting. So yeah, did they did they mention a time frame for? for that yeah i think uh, um, they said that uh, they want to use it the first time on the course starting in october so okay. maybe a few days before or maybe they are uh, uh, just uh, i don't know there's no repo on, on github so they are at the moment in, in silent mode about that mm. Um, actually, in the chat, Renato says uh, version one was with Keras and version two is the yeah, one. Yeah, okay. Yes, it's so, so, so version part one, two of the course. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Version one was, I think, but version one was more like some utilities for Keras. I, I don't think that it was an actual meant as a real library. And this version we are using now at the moment um, was meant to be a library that other people could use too. But they decided to. Uh, there are some. I think there are some changes in PyTorch, and also um, they realized that there are some. Uh, there are flaws and they restarted the complete library. Wow. Did they mention specific flaws or? or uh, no, I don't think so. I can, I can post a link to the, um, wait a second, to the issue. Okay. Um, um, yeah, I'm just, Okay. 
So this is the, the, the issue and the discussion. So the, the change in PyTorch on one hand and the new features added as time goes, Jeremy felt he had to start again from scratch to create something more intuitive that ties all the existing APIs together. I wonder what all the existing APIs are. Is that like pandas and yeah. PyTorch and what APIs are there? Yeah, about? I don't know. Well, intuitive uh, gives me hope that he's thinking about these cryptic uh, parameter names. <laughs> you, can, you can use your connections to reach out to him. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Huh. Well, that's, is, it, is this comment V1 uh, referring to the, the V1 of PyTorch or the Kyrus? Good question. I think he's referring Or is yeah. he referring to the new thing as V1? And this is... I, I understood it as the new thing. New uh, library. Okay. library. But actually... Um... Huh. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Interesting. So what else? Uh, <clears throat> what else is up that folks want to talk about? I, I just had a question on this, uh, you know, the upgrade that they are planning in the library. You know, my impression always was that, you know, uh, you know, a good library, you know, you built on the existing foundations of what you had. For instance, Microsoft is famous, you know, they always have backward compatibility to all their code. So I don't know, is, is it a good practice to, you know, let's say, you know, completely junk this code and rewrite it all over again? Yeah, I mean, it, I think, uh, in the f so when they started, it was really just meant as a, High level, um, yeah, for 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 the just for the people taking the course as a high level uh, thing okay. to work with PyTorch, and mm -hmm. then uh, yeah, I think they realized later on that they, they can make a library out of that. And I mean, API design is really, uh, yeah, it's it's a whole art on its own. I think. Mm -hmm. to, to yeah, because you know uh, what yeah. what really happens is from from a commercial mm -hmm. point of view, you know, then uh, some a developer would hesitate, you know, building building solutions on top of this because uh, you know if the underlying platform goes away, what do you do? You have so it, it's it's a bit tricky. So yeah, yeah but I don't think that. My sense is that the you know people using this in production separate from the course is maybe more aspirational than something that's actually happening a lot right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's and you, you actually you earlier meant, um, has mentioned technical debt, right? So I think that yes, you know yes. part of his strategy here is to yes. uh, acknowledge the the technical debt that um, exists in the current um, yeah. the current library and start over. Yes. Yes. I think I read I read a message from Jeremy on on Twitter where he stated that he is at the moment working on something that's going to be better than Keras. Or uh, oh, really? a guy that is uh, that is more intuitive than than Keras, and uh, yeah, I think in this version of the library, there's a lot of stuff that um, um, that is it's yeah some methods that are at the moment very good to do things, and when they change, they have to uh, delete this or change it. I don't know, and maybe he's trying to find a more general way to to describe tasks you have, and then use kind of methods that are good at the moment and then maybe exchange it in later versions but so that you don't have to uh, uh, yeah rewrite the, the API I don't know it's not it's I don't think that this version of the library can be an API that is maintained for years and stays uh, like Keras for example okay. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah I have not been following the other libraries, but I presume that, you know, let's say TensorFlow or, you know, or Microsoft and CNTK, they, they, they maintain backward compatibility, hopefully. So, yeah. yeah, well, 
I mean, I don't know. It's it's very hard to create an API, so you have to really think of what what the user wants to do, and then try to try to write code in the background that can do this. But this code yeah. is not something that you have to dig into as as users. So you can, for example, if if uh, in, in in a future version, this LR find methods has some there's some better uh, things for that, then you can exchange that by. Uh, without changing the API. So that's, I okay. think, something that's, uh, yeah, probably not so good in this version of the library and the reason why they're trying to make a new one. Yeah, yeah, possibly. I, I think because the field is changing so fast, so everybody is really, you know, chasing a moving target. So that's what, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, there's a question, I think, here for me. Let me just check. I think this is actually the guy here uh, who made this uh, LMW uh, blog post. Yeah. Uh, Sylvain? Yeah. Uh, so Sat Satya is asking Mahesh, are after the ent entity embedding matrices are fully trained, is it possible to determine? which of the features have stronger influence on predicted value? Can it help yeah. with feature selection? Yes, it can. For ex example, in one of the videos, you know, somebody uh, asked him a question that why, why are some of the embedding matrices value negative? So he said, look, it means that, you know, if let's say if a particular value stands for comedy, you know, this particular movie, you know, movie, which is a comedy movie, a negative value means that a movie is not comedy. So I think both both two issues are important. One is one is the direction, whether it is positive or negative, and the other would be the magnitude of the change. You know, if if it's very largely positive or it's very largely negative. Uh, so I I my my guess is you know the problem that we really have today is that there, it, there is a disconnect between these matrices matrices values and the real world factors. As this technology becomes more and more uh, mature, and you know then organizations will be able to probably determine. Because you know, just like you do A/B testing today, to see which of your, let's say, website, uh, you know, user interface is working, maybe in the future you could, you know, you could have a certain, you know, you, like companies do promotions, you know, today. Let's say a Walmart could be running promotions all over the world, uh, hundreds of promotions. So maybe in the future, you know, their their machine learning teams could really look at and say, okay, they could they could tie down the causal factors between running, let's say, a promotion in, let's say, Bulgaria. And seeing how how are the metrics metrics values you know of that particular of the stores in Bulgaria impacted, so I, I see a lot of possibilities really over here because see what if you analyze carefully what it is really doing is, it's putting mathematical values into knowledge which is implicit in the running of the organization you know which is a very really powerful factor. So my guess is yes it will you would be in a position to you know determine which of the you know. Uh, which of the features uh, can be, uh, it could help you in feature selection. It could, it could uh, do that because as I mentioned, you know, uh, in, in that, uh, in the paper, which has been written by the uh, Rossman stores winners, they have used uh, this even for uh, random forests. They have used the uh, matrix values even for, you know, other machine learning methods. So it's a very generic uh, methodology from that point of view. Is it clear? Satya, is it clear? Oh, is he there or not? There? Okay, I think you got it. All right. Any other thoughts or questions? Well, I, I have a thought back to embeddings again. In terms of deconvolution, I wonder, I, I haven't looked into that in depth, but you know, in Fourier, you know, convolution is like a Fourier transform. So there's a reverse Fourier transform. So maybe that's like a deconvolution. So if you can re do a reverse Fourier transform on the embeddings. I think that you would probably find out what input would give you the highest activation for each of those, uh, you know, uh, next level neurons. <laughs> See, one, one, one essential difference between uh, convolutional, uh, let's say CNNs, you know, is, is image data is inherently compositional. You know, it is inherently contain, contain, containment driven. For instance, an image, you know, uh, you can break down an image into multiple parts. 
i don't think we have the technology today to uh, you know to be able to break down entities uh, 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 also actually there are you can do it but it needs uh, my guess is it needs much more stronger <clears throat> domain knowledge than what we have and it will it will vary from you know organization to organization sector to sector and so on but i think even so, more fundamentally in the in the cnn case were deconvolving layers that uh, were created based on input that we gave the network. And I think what we're talking about trying to do here, which would be great if, if we could, is like deconvolving these embedding matrices to these real world factors that the network has never seen. Yes. Like, so it's, I mean, it's, I think it'd be, it'd be great. And it's something interesting to uh, the idea of, kind of applying operations to these embedding matrices and seeing what we can learn from them. Um, but, uh, you know, and kind of thinking about it again, like how, how would whatever operation we apply to these embedding matrices know, you know, all the gazillions of factors that, yes. that could yes. impact a particular value. That's yes. just information that's not available to the network. So it can't, yes. can't infer to that. Yeah. Well, I think in deconvolution, I'm, I'm guessing that if you take the next higher level neuron, if you set that all those embedded neurons to, for example, one zero 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 zero, so for the first neuron that you set to one, you can find out which input gave you that high that activation, or which, you know, um, the the types of inputs that gave you that highest activation. So then you can sort of see what those inputs had in common. So that's what neuron number one is looking for. Yeah. yeah, but you know, uh, so, you, so the the idea is um, going from these activation matrices and, and using it to almost group or cluster the the input values. Exactly. Actually, he's, Sebastian is raising a very valid point as regards the explain, explainability of neural networks. You know, there are, there are uh, techniques being developed, which, which will give you visibility as to, you know, what neurons, let's say in the earlier layers are impacting the neurons in the later layers. Uh, my, 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 my reading is that because there are hundreds of millions of such parameters, you know, we are still a long way in terms of being able to, you know, get visibility into the impact of certain neurons. See, in, in images, it becomes very easy. For instance, if, if you recollect, you know, the earlier lectures, which were there on imaging, you know, when Jeremy talks about data augmentation, he talks about, you know, the transforms, you're able to rotate an image, you're able to, you know, you're able to do certain things. In the forum, somebody asked him, can we do this with structured data? You know, can we do, can we do transforms with structured data? He said, no, it's not possible. One can investigate it. So to answer your question, I think visibility uh, or no explainability of uh, neural networks is a huge issue. And as we move ahead in the future, you will probably get answers to your questions. Sebastian, one, one question. Are you talking about how important is the weekday as a, as a variable or how important is, for example, Saturday? Saturday. Okay. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, if you uh, can, I just uh, Sebastian. Well, I actually, no, no, yeah. I, I take that back, Kai. I'm not even weekday or Saturday, but the the how am, um I guess the next level up neuron is the I don't know what we call it. Uh, um, you know, you're going from from Monday through Friday to the next level neuron. So how important are those in terms of weekdays and Saturdays? I guess. Actually, Jeremy makes one statement in one of the videos. He says, you know, it is possible to determine that which stores, uh, let's say in Germany, will sell milk on Wednesdays. Now, if you analyze this statement itself, you know, a, a specific store selling milk on a certain day, uh, you know, which means that there are, there is something happening in terms of being able to make such high level, uh, you know, insights. So it is doable, I'm saying, but we really don't know what is, uh, uh, what is the mathematics or whether we, we've got tools to capture this data. As of now, this is my reading. So, Sebastian, there's not there's when you use embeddings, there's not only one neuron in that comes after the embedding, but a whole bunch of neurons. So when you have an embedding matrix with fifty, uh, uh, yeah, with fifty values, you have fifty neurons uh, after that. And the next layer is kind of um, it's doing a weighted sum of those. So he's yeah, this one is determining how important 
these values in this uh, embedding vector are going through the network, I think. See, uh, okay. essentially, I think uh, uh, these, these embedding metrics values are just the weights. Because I remember him saying in one of the lectures is that all the input values are initialized to one. So, you know, the input being one, uh, the back propagation really goes and changes the weights. So, yes, there are weights, but in this case, because it's like one hot encoding, you're just putting in the weights because there's no, there is no multiplication before that. Okay, so, okay. you pick the weights and put it in. There are weights, but they are basically, I think, multiplied with one, and so they are. Okay, okay. All right. Awesome. All right. So I am, uh, as we speak, typing up this new uh, poll. So Kai, you get a chance to revise your vote, uh, as does everyone else here. Uh, and I'll have that up in a second. Um, and we'll see how we want to proceed with uh, lesson five and beyond. So this is only lesson five, five four? No, this was lesson five. We were we spent some time talking about uh, embedding matrices, revisiting yeah, yeah, embedding yeah. matrices, but uh, also lesson five. But uh, many folks had not made it through lesson five, so we're oh, it's very challenging. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, has has anyone get... here looked at? I'm um, just based on the previous. Sorry, I'm so late. I, I slept on again. Um, has anyone here looked at um, ResNet and ResNext at all? No. Okay. So the interesting, just to add to your previous uh, insight conversation, so the, the really big idea between uh, ResNext and traditional CNNs, I think, is highly related to embeddings. Um, essentially, what ResNet tries to avoid is having extra layers where you actually have to create a mapping where no real mapping exists. So if I have a seven-layer so, neural network, David, can I? Push sorry, you need to wind on, up. I'm sorry. Can I yeah. push pause can, on this and, and ask you to spend a few minutes talking about this at the beginning of uh, next week's yeah, session? Yeah, sure. Sorry. Yeah. Awesome. Fair, fair <laughs> enough, Sam. Sorry about that. Yeah. All right, everyone. All right. Bye. Uh, catch you Bye. next time. I'll try to right, be there on time next time, guys. So take care. <laughs> okay. Bye. Take care, Bye. everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.